Hello, friends, and welcome to the Friends in Fiction show Behind the Book with four New York Times bestselling authors and endless stories. I'm Mary Kay Andrews. And I'm Meg Walker. And on behalf of Mary Kay's co-founders and co-hosts, Kristen Harmel, Christy Woodson Harvey, and Patty Callahan Henry, we are excited to welcome you to a special episode of Friends in Fiction Behind the Book, a quicker deep dive into the life and work of one of our favorite authors. And today... We are thrilled to welcome my good friend, the New York Times and internationally bestselling author of more than 20 books, Lisa Unger. With books published in 30 key languages and millions of copies sold worldwide, Lisa is widely regarded as a master of suspense. And we are so excited to talk to her about her latest, just released this week, the new, the, 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 the <laughs> new couple in 5B, which has gotten a starred review in Kirkus. Now, for people who don't know about the book world, <laughs> Kirkus is the Mikey of the book world because they don't like anything. <laughs> you get, it's if true. You get, if you get a Kirkus starred review, you are you are a, a winner. She has a slew of incredible blurbs and she's been named to loads of most anticipated lists. This book is so good, you guys. You have got to snap it up. I am in the middle of it. I wanted to finish it before we talked to you today, but I didn't get to. I know, I know Mary Kay did, but um, yeah. all right, Lisa. So give us your elevator pitch. What is the new couple in 5B about? Okay, so when we open the cover of The New Couple, we meet Rosie and Chad, and they're a young couple. She's a true crime writer, and he's an actor, and they are just, you know, their luck has been all bad. They're struggling to make ends meet. They're, you know, they're trying for a family, and it's really not going very well. And so when they receive a surprise inheritance of a dream apartment in an iconic New York City building, they think that, you know, this is like the time when their luck is going to change. But as soon as they move in, things get pretty creepy. And um, the building, the Windermere, has a dark history. And Rosie needs to dig into its secrets before she, too, falls under its spell. Ooh. And that is the setup for the new couple in 5B. You know, I like what you just said about it's it their dark secrets. But when she encounters the apartment, she's struck by how much light there is. Yes. Right. Yes. It yes, looks absolutely. like a dream come true. Yeah. And it, the apartment itself is actually uh, is based on an apartment that was owned by my aunt um, when I was a, 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 a kid. And she was like a very glamorous woman. She worked in fashion and she had this amazing two bedroom apartment in this elevator building, you know, elevator operator, doorman, the whole thing um, on Park Avenue in Murray Hill. And to me at that time, it was like this dream place. Like it was like the place that you would inhabit in New York City. And um, yet, you know, she was a very complicated woman. So we would walk into this beautiful light filled apartment that was like everything that you would imagine should be like chic and gorgeous and perfect. And yet, you know, it was really, really uh, complicated, the relationship, the relationship and the experiences that we had there. So there was always this like strange undercurrent. And that was like kind of the piece that came forward with me for this book. Oh, I love um, that. I love that um, that neighborhood I know because that's where I stay when I go to New York. I used yeah. to stay at this place like at Park and 38th, right, Meg? Yes. The and they turned it into a homeless shelter during um COVID. Oh wow. So it's not yeah. it's not open anymore, but that's the neighborhood where I where I always stay. Yeah, I mean I love Murray Hill. Like I feel like it has this like vibe of old New York. Like yes. there's a there's a dream New York City that kind of belongs only to me. Like I have all these, I've had this lifelong relationship with the city. And I lived there for 13 years. I went to college there. I work there. Most of my family is from the, you know, the, you know, one of the five boroughs. And, you know, I always there's like a place, a city in New York City that is like part dream, part imagination, part memory part of my experiences now and like I feel like that place winds up in my novels a lot and it's cool. it is New York but it's it's my New York City oh I love that I, I you know the the love for New York City and the familiarity with the city really comes off like leaps off the page like oh thank you you know you and I worked at the same place for a long time I I spent a ton of time in the city too and yeah the peep the the 
Rosie and Chad are so real. Their struggles, like a young couple trying to make it in the city and scraping together their rent money and yeah, the I sounds know. and smells of the city and why people love it and why people don't. It, it, it's all so <laughs> real. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, it really felt very real. It feels like every time I write about New York City, I feel like it's a little bit of a love letter to a certain, to a certain, like in, especially in, in the new couple, you know, there are pieces like, you know, when I looked out my aunt's dining room window, there was the the Chrysler building, which to me is like one of the most beautiful buildings in the world. Yeah. And there's such a romance to it, you know, it's such a, like, um, it's such an icon of like that, you know, that New York City vibe that, that continues to inspire me always. Well, tell me about the spark of the idea for this book, the moment when you went, yeah, yeah, that is my next book. Yeah, so there's kind of like a collision. So it was the apartment thing and this this kind of ongoing obsession that I have with places, like the places where we go, the places where Same. we live, the places that we build, the places that we tear down and then try to rebuild, you know, like that is a theme that definitely runs through my work. So there was that piece. And then a couple of years ago, I had occasion to reread um, Rosemary's Baby by, uh, by Ira Levin. And it's, I mean, Ira Levin is like, you know, if, if whoever is not familiar with him should definitely become familiar with him. Like he's, he only re- wrote like about five or six books in his, in his career, but every single one of them is different. And every single one of them has a really cool and unique energy. And Rosemary's Baby is no different, but there were like a couple pieces from Rosemary's Baby that like kind of always bothered me. Like I, I didn't love that Rosie didn't have any agency you know, that was, that was, uh, Rosemary didn't have any agency in that book. And so that, that kind of always bothered me how she, she felt like, you know, she always felt like she was like ping ponging between the neighbor and the husband and, you know, um, the, uh, the friend, you know, who was like, don't move into the building or whatever. So I was always like, I always felt like she needed more, she needed more agency. And so that, that was something that, you know, that was a piece that I wanted to, to bring into this book. And then I also had, um, you know, there's a, there's a, a, a past that she had in the book that's like basically just hinted at. So I really wanted to, you know, I really wanted to explore that. So in that way, like those two pieces for a character moving into a building that has a dark history, like I wanted to really bring those to the to the page a little bit more so that we had more of Rosie than we had of anything else. Um, so yeah, so it was really like a, co- it was really like a collision of those things. And when I started to hear Rosie's voice and started to like, think about where she came from and why she might be vulnerable to the winter mirror in a way that other people are not. Um, those were all the different little pieces that started to like, you know, knit together until the book, until the book was underway. Okay. That's why she's named Rosie for Rosemary. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, it was I a little bit of, uh, not intentional. It just kind of, <laughs> it just kind of turned out that way. Yeah. I will never forget the movie trailer for that, that poster with that creepy baby stroller. Yeah. Yeah. And I didn't want the baby the baby thing either no no but anybody from anybody <laughs> yeah like anybody <laughs> anybody from that era will remember that baby stroller yes <laughs> i like the rosy part but not the not the baby part so there was oh, yeah. just things that i wanted to yeah. you know i kind of wanted to but in my own way of course i mean it's just like a jumping off point right, right. like you know in the way that confessions on the 745 was kind of loosely inspired by strangers on a train it's just right. like a piece it's just like a jumping off point for you know what i think is pretty pretty modern and 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 unique to the to the book of course Demo, definitely all right well you mentioned confessions on the 745 so i want to talk a little bit about your book titles because they are a whole vibe right <laughs> confessions on the 745 secluded cabin sleep six the new couple in 5b Like, do you come up with these? Is it a collaborative process with your editor? And like, what do you, why do you think the specificity of titles like that resonate with readers? I wish I could take credit for these titles. I really do. I, in, 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 uh, in titles for me, like, you know, there's only one rule that I can see what makes something work, right? Here's the thing. If I absolutely love a title and I think there cannot be any other title for the book and I'm deeply, deeply attached to this title, that is the title that will not make it onto the cover. 
<laughs> that is the title. Bank on my that. editor will be like, you know, no. Like, and then I can tell that she doesn't like it when, you know, we're back and forth about the manuscript and and she and she just calls it the book or the manuscript. Like she's she's avoiding using the refuses title to use her title. Have, <laughs> I have titled it. I'm like, okay. So I mean, and I really do think it is very much a collaboration. And like if they don't like your title and you and you um you know, and I, and I always defer to them on title because, you know, really you think it's the, the domain of the author, but truly it's really the domain of the marketing and sales yeah. department. Right. And so I always, you know, I always defer to them, you know, to a certain extent, but it usually turns out being like a giant, like back and forth email chain between me my agent, you know, and my editor, like, okay, what about this? What about this? No, that's not quite right. What about this one? Blah, blah, blah. And then finally, there's one that everybody's like, oh my God, that's it. Right. And it's usually not, I have to be honest, it's usually not one that I came, <laughs> that I came up with. <laughs> it's my editor a lot of the times. And uh, Margaret Marbury was responsible for Confessions on the 745. And my title for that was, that book was Black Butterfly. Um, and I mean, I know it's, it's not as good, of course, as confession on the 745 and then, um, the new couple in 5B, um, it was something like that. So I can't, I actually don't remember what the original title was. Like, that's, what's great when something is so, you know, when something is so perfect, then you kind of forget all the iterations that came before it. So yeah, yeah it's very much a collaboration. I, I, I like, I mean, Kathy, I think you've talked to Pam Dorman about this because she's like the queen of these like super uber specific book titles, right? right? Like Lillian Boxfish takes a walk. Like yeah. there's no other book called that, right? You could Eleanor, tell, right? Oliphant, Eleanor Oliphant is completely fine. Right. Right? Whatever right. That was. right. Yeah. And you could name this book The Apartment and yeah. everyone be like, read this. I forget what it's called, but you're never going to forget this title. Right. No. Exactly. I mean, I think that that's also the challenge too of, you know, finding a title that is, you know, that evokes a certain feeling, but retains the uniqueness of the book. You know, you don't want it to disappear into every other, every other title that's out there. Yeah. You know, in her blurb for the new couple in 5B, see how I just dropped that title? Nice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anna Ray said, if the Shinings Overlook Hotel were a luxury apartment building, it might resemble the Windermere. Uh, now, we've already talked about it, you know, the Rosemary Baby Echo and maybe some rear window vibes, where even the place you think of as home is could be built on dark se secrets and lies. Okay, this okay. book really has more supernatural vibe than I was expecting. And so my question is, do you actually believe in haunted buildings? Have you ever lived in one? Well, it's a kind of a layered answer to that because I, I do I do believe that in this world, as we know it, there are far more questions than there are answers. And I do believe in layers of existence, but only in the most Jungian um, sort of quantum physics type of way, right? So Carl Jung believed in the supernatural and his mother was a medium and he had a near-death experience that in fact, like led him to meet a person that he considered to be his spirit guide and somebody that he consulted with for, you know, most of his life. And so Jung believed that the a-causal or the anomalous event deserved to be explored. Whereas the scientific method thinks that the a-causal or anomalous event should be discarded, right? So I, I, I'm i kind of with Young, you know, always. <laughs> He's like kind of a lifelong obsession for me. So I believe that we know more about space than we know about the human brain. And I think that these types of experiences have more to do with the brain than they do with anything that might be supernatural and that there's a psycho-spiritual realm. You asked the question. <laughs> <laughs> that there's a psycho-spiritual realm that some of us have access to and some of us don't. 
So that's kind of oh. the long answer to, to, to that question. But, you know, I do, I do believe that there are, th that there are things that cannot be explained. And I love to kind of dip my toe into that in my fiction, because I'm very interested in character and I'm very interested in layers of experience. I'm interested in altered states you know, whether it's addiction or fugue or, you know, even just like not getting very good night's sleep, you know, like what does that do to your perception, right? Like, so I'm very interested in these ideas of like, how is, how is our perception altered and then what is actually true? And I do think that buildings are, um, I do think that they hold energy. I do think that when, because we give off energy, we give off energy in waves. I mean, quite literally. And I ha and of course our buildings are, you know, they're a product of our energetic output. I mean, we, we build them with our own hands, right? So it's like, it, it is nature in a way. It's, it's human nature to build a shelter and then to live your life there. So how is it possible? How is it not possible that those places retain the energy? I mean, we've all walked right. into a place and been like, oh, this, this <laughs> there's something not right here, right? We've all had that yes. experience where you walk into a place and you feel like warm and welcomed and like, oh, this is so amazing. And so like, I do believe that place is called energy, but I don't, don't have any answers for why that might be actually. That was the short answer. I remember when we were looking at houses to buy this last yeah. time. Um, we went to one and I loved it. I thought it was adorable. And my husband was like, he whispers in my ear, we have to get out of here right now. And we get outside and I was like, what's the matter? And he said, this is the house of my nightmares. He said, it looks exactly like every house where I have a bad dream takes place oh in that exact floor plan. He's like, <laughs> we have to leave here and never come back. I was like, Roger that. Like, I didn't oh feel God. it. I yeah. didn't see I mean, it, but like, I respect it, you know, like. For sure. You yeah. don't understand it, but you respect yeah. it. You maybe yeah. didn't experience the same feeling, but you understand yeah, it's not like I could insist that we live there after he had that feeling. Right, you know? exactly. You can't. I mean, you can't be the one to insist, right? Yeah, no. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about your writing process because um, you do such an incredible job like crafting this dark atmospheric feeling and, and of ratcheting up the tension and then layering, uh, like going back, like the dual timeline thing and going back and forth and sort of, feeding us pieces of the story as we need to know them. So do you outline that? Um, do you know the ending before you start? Or is it, are you a plan, a plotter or a pantser? <laughs> yeah, so I'm really not, I'm sorry. Can everybody like hear my dog whining miserably? I'm sorry about that. I can't. <laughs> the, 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 it wouldn't bother me though. To edit that out. Um, <laughs> but yes, I'm, I'm definitely, a, I mean, I hate the word pantser. Um, but cause I, it seems like you just like accidentally wrote a novel, like you just happen to, you know, like by the seat of your pants, right? Something it's not, it's, I think of it more as like gardening, like there's a seed that gets planted and that grows and that, you know, you give it light and air and maybe do some pruning and, you know, a branch goes off where you didn't expect it. So that's really how more, how I see the process, everything begins and ends for me with character voice. So I can have a, you know, like we were talking about those collision of ideas, but if I don't have a character voice, like if there isn't somebody who um, is speaking to me or multiple play or multiple people who have stories to tell then then there isn't a book, right? So I could be obsessed about a topic, but the topic is never going to be the, it's never going to be the start of a novel. It's always going to be the character. And um, so I very much feel that plot flows from character. So character comes first and plot flows from character. For me, there's no plot and then character when, where characters then get inserted into that. So um, that I follow character voice. I'm a very early morning writer. So my goal, my golden creative hours are from 5 a.m. to noon. I feel like that's when I'm closest to my dream brain. And that's where, you know, the the that's kind of where I've trained myself to be my mo my most creative. And um I um and I and I really, you know, honor that time. It doesn't necessarily mean there's going to be a certain number of words. You know, because of the way I write, it's like an organic process. So there's like an ebb and a flow. Um, so there's some days that you can't keep the pages from coming. And there's some days where you're just kind of like, 
ripping your hair out. Hey, <laughs> did I ever write a book before? Do I even know how to write a book? Like this is not working. And so then you get up and do something like bake a cake or do the laundry or go to the gym. Anything that's not like you can't get on social media. You can't do anything like that. Otherwise you're just out of that brain for good. Right. So that's pretty much how um, it works for me. And I do you know, how it evolves on the page is very much how it evolves for me. Um, like, you know, as it evolves for me, the very, very much the same way that it will for my reader. Um, so it's, it's kind of that it's, it's almost like I write for the same reason that I read, because I want to know what's happening or what's going to happen to the people who are living in my head. Yeah. I saw in your Substack recently and shout out for Lisa's newsletter, Everybody should sign up for her Substack. It's called Notes from the Margin. Anyway, you wrote recently that the Emmy Award-winning actress Sarah Michelle Gellar showed photos of her vacation reads on Instagram, which included the new couple in 5B. And then she wrote you to let you know that she loved it. Did this come out of nowhere? Was it like a major fangirl moment? Um, oh my has she has she bought has she optioned <laughs> it? I mean, come on. Yes. I know, right? Write her back I, and tell her you want her to adopt it. <laughs> yeah, I will. I'm going to tell her. Let's tell her right now. Okay, yeah. Sarah. <laughs> Sarah. <laughs> Sarah. Hey, listen, let's do this. Um, I So a couple of years ago, she she wrote something. Or she, she was interviewed for um, for a publication, and she mentioned my book which was for me, I mean, like a totally crazed fangirl moment. Like, you know, I mean, I just love Sarah Michelle Gellar. I'm like, you know, Buffy the Vampire Slayer is like one of my all time cruel intentions, like the whole thing. It's just like amazing. Right. So I love her. And um, so I wrote her a note on Instagram thanking her, you know, and I was like, you know, of course, you know, I was following her, but of course, you know, she wasn't following me. So I wrote her this note, like, thank you so much. But of course, you know, it probably went to her junk. And, but then eventually, like a few months later, she did, I guess, see it and write back to me. And she's like, oh, I'm a huge fan. I said, oh my God, thank you so much. I'm a huge fan. This is amazing. <laughs> and then every year I just kind of send her a note and say, hey, you know, would you, um, would you like a, would you like a copy of my, a signed copy of my new book? And every year she says yes. And um, so this year she was kind enough to take it on vacation and then post about it and, I mean, it's amazing how much everybody, I mean, it's not amazing, but it's just notable how much everybody loves Sarah Michelle Gellar. Everybody was like just over the moon about it. And it comes up over and over again. Like people are like, <laughs> oh my God, Buffy read your book, you know? <laughs> and so it's really it's a completely like, you know, joyful fangirl, like surprise thing it was awesome. That's awesome. So Lisa, you're a, a book a year, right? Can you tell us what yes. you're working on um, next? Yeah. So, um, well, I, I never talk about a book until it's about to hit the shelves mainly because it's, I'm not really even sure what it's about yet, even though it's done, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, it's done the copy edits. I'm, I'm in copy edits right now. So I'm, I'm pretty much ready to, you know, start thinking about what it was about. Why, but I will tell, I will say a couple of things. Of course, it's psychological suspense. And of course, um, you know, bad things happen, like a lot of them. And also it is something, it is based on something that happened to me while I was traveling with my family. Oh. So it's actually pulled directly from my, um, or the inspiration comes directly from my travels, I should say. Oh, I love that. Speaking of travels, we know you're embarking on a big book tour this week yeah. as the new couple in 5B lands in bookstores. Tell everybody where they can meet you in person out on the road. Oh, yeah. So I'm going to be at Pombolo Books to, uh, tonight, um, which is, what is the date today? It's March 4th, 4th. right? Yeah, March 5th at uh, M. Judson, um, Inkwood Books in New Jersey on March 6th. Um, I'll be at the Unlikely Story on March 7th in Plainville outside of Boston. I'll be at the Cleveland Library um, uh, with Jen Jumba um, on Friday. Okay, March what 8th. is that? A? Yep. <laughs> with our pal Ron Block. <laughs> <laughs> and then I will be um, at Foxtails on Saturday the 9th. Um, with my uh, pal Jocelyn Jocelyn Jackson, she's going to be interviewing me, 
And um, I will then be at Oxford Exchange on Sunday, uh, March 10th. So yeah, there's lots of places to, to find me on the road. I hope um, people will turn out and signed books will be available at all those stores as, whether, as, as well as at Mysterious Bookshop um, and Poison Pen. And awesome. tell everybody where they, can, where they can find you online. Oh my gosh, you can't like not find me online. I'm <laughs> everywhere. So it's, <laughs> it's like, I'm L.A. Unger on Instagram. I'm author Lisa Unger on Facebook. I'm Lisa Unger on Twitter. Um, if you um, come to my website, lisaunger.com, and you sign up for my newsletter, you get a free short story. Mm -hmm. and right exciting and um yeah and I think you know it would be really hard like if you're looking for me you will find me like there's <laughs> I'm <not> <laughs> rock. <laughs> I love that okay Lisa thanks for being such a wonderful guest today we hope all of you watching will go out and grab your copies of the new couple in 5b Yay. one place you can do that is in the friends and fiction shop on bookshop.org, where your purchases support our show and our beloved indie bookstores nationwide. Love that. And all of you out there, don't forget to tune in every Wednesday night here on Facebook or YouTube for a brand new, longer form content about books and authors and the reading and writing worlds. So you can find everything about the Friends in Fiction universe from the live show to the podcast, to our newsletter, to in-person events, information about how to purchase our guest books, to updates from the Friends and Fiction official book club, all on our website at friendsandfiction.com. Thank you for tuning in, everybody. We'll see you next time. Thank you, guys. Thank you so Thanks. much. <laughs>